Will you turn in your Bible with me this morning to Philippians chapter 1. I appreciate you watching every Sunday morning. And I hope the Bible study is a real blessing to you. If you're saved, then our aim is to establish you in the faith, get you to understand what you have in Christ, and get you to be built upon the foundation of the Apostle Paul, which has to do with the gospel of Christ. If you're not saved, then our aim is to show you that Jesus Christ died for you. It's our aim to make you to know and understand that when Jesus Christ hang on Calvary, the Bible said that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. That is to say that you were enemies without God, without hope in the world, but God in Christ reconciled you along with the rest of the world. I'm not talking about saved you. I'm talking about that God Almighty fixed it through the death of Christ that he could be friendly to you no matter how vulgar or vile or how mean or ornery <clears throat> you might be, no matter what your attitude toward Almighty God or the Lord Jesus Christ or the preachers of this world have been, God fixed it so that he can be good to you. God fixed it so that he can be gracious to you. God fixed it through the death of Christ that he can save you. You see, the big deal is not a matter of you <clears throat> changing what you are. Now, changing the way you live is something else. But changing what you are is an impossibility for you. The Bible said that you were born in sin. The Bible said all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. It said there's none good, no, not one. That there's not a just person on earth that doeth good and sinneth not. So we know then by the Bible that none of us are good. Our character is not good. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But God, instead of pouring out his wrath upon the world, instead of cursing the world because of what we are, he cursed his son. And the Bible said that Jesus Christ at Calvary became a curse for us. The Bible said, Him that knew no sin became our sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. So how can you be saved? Well, you can't be saved by changing what you are. You can't be saved by quitting certain sins. It's good that you quit, but if you were to quit tobacco, alcohol, dancing, <laughs> whatever it is that the religious system of this world tells you is bad, if you were to quit doing all that, help your neighbor and live as good as it's possible for you to live in this world, but never receive Christ as your Savior, then you'd later on die and end up in hell. Or the rapture of the church would come, we that are saved would go up, and God's wrath would fall on you. So our purpose in this Bible study has to do with establishing believers in the faith and showing lost sinners how to be saved. <clears throat> We've been talking about rightly dividing the word of truth. You see, the truth, the word of truth is the gospel of our salvation. What is that? That Christ died for our sins and that he was buried and that he rose again. Now there are more than one gospel in the Bible. There's the gospel of the kingdom, the gospel of the grace of God, the gospel of Christ, uh, the gospel of the circumcision, gospel of the uncircumcision, there's the everlasting God. There's more than ten gospels referred to in the Bible. <clears throat> Which gospel is it? Which good news is it that God has for you? Well, it's the gospel of the grace of God. It's that gospel given to the Apostle Paul. In Acts chapter 9, the, this man, this little Jew, this rebellious, antagonistic, blasphemous little individual named Saul is threatening those that believe the truth. He's at enmity with the Lord. And God Almighty gave him the gospel on that day. 
He heard that Christ died for his sins. He saw that Christ died for his sins. He understood that Christ died for his sins. And on that day, God saved him, a rebel, a sinner, a blasphemer. God saved him and gave him to be a pattern to all of us that later on would trust Christ as our Savior. Paul was a blasphemous sinner and God saved him. Paul, the blasphemous sinner, believed in Jesus Christ as his Savior. That makes me know that you can too if you want to. God saved a blasphemous sinner named Saul. That tells me that God can save you also if you'll trust his Son as your Savior. Say, but Brother Moore, you don't understand my moral condition. I don't care about your moral condition. Doesn't matter to me about your moral condition. Doesn't matter where you've been or what you were doing while you were there. It doesn't matter how vile and sinful your character is. When Jesus Christ died at Calvary, Jesus Christ died for you. Jesus Christ suffered, bled, and died for you that God could save you. Will you trust him as your savior today? The Bible said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou should be saved. People say, well, that's too easy. Why do you want to make it hard? I mean, it, it isn't easy when you consider what Jesus Christ went through, when you consider the fact that Jesus Christ was arrested and then he was, uh, he was grilled by all these people. They, all these questions were put to him. And the witnesses lied against him. They carried him into a hall and they stripped his clothing off him. He had already been beaten. They had hang him by his arms and beat him so that his back was cut to shreds. <clears throat> and they stripped his clothing off him and they laughed at him and they sneered at him. They poked fun at him. They bowed down before him. They put a purple robe upon him, a crown of thorns upon his head and they put a reed in his hand and they made jokes about him being the king and they got out on their knees in front of him and they belittled him, laughed at him, laughed him to scorn. Why? Because he was suffering your shame. He was taking your shame for you. He was taking for you that which you deserve. You deserve to be laughed at. You deserve to be scorned. You deserve to be put down. You deserve to be stripped. You that are listening to my voice, all the shameful, despicable things that are hidden away in the closet of your life, all those evil, vile things that you're guilty of and you don't want anybody to know about them. Suppose we stripped you and made known everything there is to know about you. How would you like that? Well, Jesus Christ was stripped. Jesus Christ stood naked as he bore your shame. The Bible said he became sin for us. Whatever you are, whatever secret intent of your heart is, that's what Christ became. And he stood there naked in front of those people. And they laughed him to scorn because he's taking your place. It is not right today to laugh at a Christian. Why? Because that's Christ, that Christian was laughed at in Christ. It is not right for you to sneer at Bible believers and call them Bible thumpers and make sarcastic, nasty remarks about them. Why? Jesus Christ took that for them. And you that are saved, you that are saved by grace through faith and yet you gossip about other Christian people. You would crucify again the saint that believes in your Savior. You that are preachers out there that call yourself grace preachers. You claim believe that Jesus Christ died for the sins of this world. You claim to believe that Jesus Christ died for some sinner out there and you know something about 
some individual in your church maybe or some friend and you know some secret thing about him or her and you go and gossip to someone else about that you low down snake in the grass you low down rat why don't you do what is exactly right for you to do and recognize that you're not qualified to be what you claim to be you claim to be a preacher a bishop you're no bishop The Bible is clear on these things. Jesus Christ bore the shame for every Bible believer in the world today. I have absolutely no right to dig into a Bible believer's life and come out of there with something they've been guilty of in their past and spread it around. Jesus Christ bore that shame. Jesus Christ took that shame. Jesus Christ suffered for that shame. Why should I, as a believer, try to make my brother suffer for the shame that Christ suffered for? You call yourself a preacher and a Bible teacher. You're no preacher and a Bible teacher. You're a rat. You're a snake. Someone comes to you in private and they say, Brother so-and-so, I've got a problem I'd like to talk to you about. So that individual sits down and you listen to their problem and they tell you about some sin in their life. They're seeking for help. They're seeking for relief from something that they're guilty of. And what do you do? You have an opportunity later on and you get with some other friend and you tell them about what that individual told you. You rat. You're a snake. You're a hypocrite. You're a viper. And you're not worthy to be called an evangelist or a pastor. If a man desire the office of a bishop, the Bible said he desireth a good work. A bishop then must be blameless. <laughs> People say, well, I know so-and-so, and he doesn't drink alcohol, and he doesn't use tobacco, and this and that and the other. Yeah, but he gossips. He would crucify anew some of the saints that are in the congregation if it were left up to him, even though they believe on the very Savior that he says he's preaching. So Jesus Christ stood in that hall in front of those people and he's naked before them and he's suffering your shame for you. They take that robe off of him and they put his own clothing back on him and they put the cross of Barabbas, a murderer and a thief and a robber, the man that, desired, that uh, deserved to die, they put his cross upon the back of Christ and Jesus Christ bearing another man's cross, bearing your cross, if you please, went forth to Calvary. They get him to Calvary and they drive the spikes in his hands and in his feet and they hang him there and Jesus Christ died for you. Jesus Christ was numbered with the transgressors. You're the transgressor. Jesus Christ was numbered among the criminals of that day. He was seen to be a criminal. He was believed to be a criminal. Why? Because he became a criminal for you. Because he became sin for you. Because he became what you are by nature and what you are by desire. And he suffered for it at Calvary. God Almighty judged him at Calvary in your behalf. God Almighty found him guilty in your behalf. God, the righteous judge, condemned him to damnation in your behalf. And God poured out his wrath upon him in your behalf. And so Christ died in your behalf. He was buried in your behalf. But the grave and your sins could not hold him. He arose victorious over your sins. He arose victorious over your death and over the grave. The question arises, you being the sinner that you are, you being the vile person that you are, what's going to happen to you when you die? 
How are you going to have victory over your sin? The wages of sin is death. That's eternal death. How are you going to get out the grave? I mean, we know how you can get in the grave. I mean, we understand that. We know about that. But how are you going to get out the other side? Forget about the fact that they're going to roll you in front of some church building there in a beautiful casket that costs thousands of dollars with all the beautiful flowers on top of it and have some preacher stand up and say pretty things about you. Forget about all that. That isn't going to help you at all. The question is, how are you going to get out of there? How are you going to get out of the grave? How are you going to rise from that state of death that is the result of your sins? Well, the answer to that is, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and God Almighty will save you from that horrible death. And instead of dying that horrible death for your sins, one day, if the Lord tarries, you'll just go to sleep in Christ. Instead of experiencing the horror of death and the grave and damnation, if you trust Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, then someday you will just fall off into a deep sleep in Christ You'll just go to rest in Christ until the rapture. And then you'll be resurrected along with all the saints of God. Get a new body and caught up together with all the saints to meet the Lord in the air. And so ever be with the Lord. How can this be yours? By believing on Jesus as your Savior. It can be yours by trusting Him, believing that He died for your sins at Calvary, believing that He paid for all your sins at Calvary. Won't you turn your case over to Him? Won't you trust Him? Look in Philippians chapter 1. In Philippians chapter 1, verse 9, And this I pray that your love may abound yet more and more in all knowledge and in all judgment, that you may approve things that are excellent, that you may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ. We're talking about approving things that are excellent. We're talking about comparing the gospel that Paul preached that I've been telling you about this morning. We've been talking about comparing that with that which is in the time to come. The gospel that is preached in Hebrews and James and 1st, 2nd Peter and the book of Revelation, that's not the same gospel that is preached in Romans through Philemon. The hope that is presented to the people in Romans through Philemon, the hope that is presented to believers in this day is not the same hope that's presented to these people over here. Salvation is by grace through faith in this age here. Salvation is by works through faith over here. James in chapter 2 says, without, uh, without works, it's impossible to make it. He says, faith without works is dead. The man that believes in this age has to prove that he believes. And he has to endure unto the end. The man that believes the gospel preached over here must endure temptation, as in James chapter 1, under the coming of the Lord. He must endure the temptation of taking the mark of the beast. He's going to live in a day when he cannot buy or sell unless he has the mark or the name of the beast. He's got to be branded. He cannot buy or sell. He can't take care of his household. He can't take care of his family. He cannot get a job. He can't buy or sell unless he's got, the, unless he's got that mark. Every believer over here has to endure that kind of thing. They've got to endure it till the second coming of Christ. When Jesus Christ comes, he's going to destroy the Antichrist. He's going to destroy that beast that offered that mark. And so the believer over here has to endure to that time. 
you back here don't have to endure anything. Jesus Christ worked it all for you. Jesus Christ endured the cross. He suffered the shame. He bore it all at Calvary for you. These people over here look forward to the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ for salvation is open unto them in that day. But we that are in this age look back to the cross because salvation is free to us by the cross. We that are in this age of grace look back. The fountain of blood that redeems us was opened unto us at the cross and we're redeemed by His blood. By faith in Jesus Christ, believing that He died for us, we're redeemed today. But these people over here look forward to redemption at the second coming. They look forward to that fountain of blood at the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. Turn in your Bible to Zechariah. In Zechariah chapter 12, Zechariah will be before Matthew. Go to Matthew and back up two books. Zechariah chapter 12. In Zechariah chapter 12, the context is the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. In Zechariah chapter 12, notice in verse uh, 7. Zechariah 12, 7. The Lord also shall save the tents of Judah first that the glory of the house of David and the glory of the inhabitants of Jerusalem do not magnify themselves against Judah. In that day shall the Lord defend the inhabitants of Jerusalem. He that is feeble among them in that day shall be as David. In other words, the feeble are going to made, be made strong in the coming of the Lord. And the house of David shall be as God, as the angel of the Lord before them. Verse 9, it shall come to pass in that day when he comes again, Second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Not the rapture, second coming. That part which is on the other side of the wrath over here. Second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. It shall come to pass in that day I'll seek to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem. During that period of time there, the Antichrist is going to gather together the nations of this world to fight against the Lord. And so they're going to be gathered for the battle of Armageddon. And the Lord Jesus Christ is going to come down as in Revelation chapter 19. And they're going to be waiting there to fight against Him. And the battle is going to be before Him there. And He's going to destroy them in that day. He's going to smash the nations of this world. He's going to destroy the political system of this world. The rotten, filthy, vulgar, vile system of this world is going to be destroyed in that day. The Bible said the love for money is the root of all evil. After he comes again in that day, then there's going to be no more idols. An angel is going to come down from heaven according to Revelation chapter 20 and he's going to lay hold on the dragon, that old devil, Satan himself, and he's going to chain him in a bottomless pit. He's going to shut him up there and set a seal upon him that he can deceive the nations no more for 1,000 years. In other words, for 1,000 years there will be no antichrist. There will be no devil to tempt people. There will be no evil spirits. There will be no idols to be worshipped. All of these things will be done away with at the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ and for 1,000 years men will be at liberty to go up and worship the King, the Lord of hosts, and to pay honor to Him. That's when He comes again. Uh, Zechariah chapter 12 verse 10, I will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and of supplications and they shall look upon me whom they have pierced. They shall mourn for him as one mourneth for his only son and uh, shall be in bitterness for him as one that is in bitterness for his firstborn. And he goes on and tells about the attitude of them in that day. According to Revelation chapter 11, the Bible said it, and all Israel shall be saved, as it is written. The deliverer shall come out of Zion and turn away ungodliness from Jacob. He said, for this is my covenant unto them when I shall take away their sin. You see, the sins of the Bible believer in this age is taken away already. It's taken away at the cross and is taken away by faith in the cross. But the sins of these believers over here are not taken away until Jesus Christ comes again. Now look in Zechariah chapter 13 and just believe what you read. 
in Zechariah chapter 13, verse 1, In that day there shall be a fountain opened to the house of David and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem for sin and for uncleanness. When will the fountain be opened unto these believers over here? At the second coming of Christ. When is the fountain opened to you that are listening to my voice? It was opened unto you in A.D. 33. It's been opened unto you ever since then. It's been opened unto you through the preaching and the teaching of the Apostle Paul. The fountain for your sins, the fountain of blood, the redemption from your sin and from ungodliness has been made available to you by the gospel of Christ. What? That Jesus Christ died for your sins and and that he was buried and that he rose again. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. The opportunity is now. The Bible said today is the day of salvation. Now is the accepted time. The Lord will accept you today. You know, that's all. It absolutely overwhelms me. If I look back there beyond the cross, men brought their sacrifices to the Lord in that day. They brought their gifts to God in that day, but God Almighty is offering the gift to you. Nothing in my hand I bring, the song says, simply to thy cross I cling. God is asking nothing of you today. He's requiring nothing of you today. The gift is from God. The gift is eternal life. The Bible said the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. God has a gift for you. God does not require sacrifice from you, but there they offered sacrifices. God offered one sacrifice for your sins forever. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Look in Zechariah chapter 13, verse 2. It shall come to pass in that day, saith the Lord of hosts, that I'll cut off the names of the idols out of the land. They shall no more be remembered. Also I'll cause the prophets and the unclean spirit to pass out. That is not true in here. They're on every side today. Evil spirits on every side. False prophets, false teachers, and false preachers. Who would deceive you? They would suck you in. They want your money. They plead with you and they cry unto you and they tell you that unless you send them such and such amount of money, they're going off there. Let them go. In this day over here, the false prophets will be done away with. They'll be put out of the land. But between the rapture and the church and the second coming of Christ, they're going to be very prominent in there. But you can be saved right now. How? Just believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, believing that he died for your sins. Believe in the redemption that is free